Hi, welcome to the Mental Wellness Journey, Honor the Authentic You. I'm really excited today to have Dr. Sam Shea with us. Um, he's going to give us a great overview and share his expertise, so it's really a privilege to have him here today. He actually walked his own health journey from being chronically unwell from ages six to eight and overcoming anxiety, insomnia, chronic gut issues, sugar addiction, and video game addiction. He dedicated, he's dedicated his life to natural medicine to get himself and others well, and others well, which led him to functional medicine and functional testing. He's an Institute for Functional Medicine certified practitioner. He's a certified fit genes practitioner, a Kalish practitioner for the Kalish Institute for Functional Medicine. He has a doctor of chiropractic and an acupuncturist. He's founder of www drsamshay.com, a cutting edge health blog on functional genetics, on functional genetics, functional testing, and addictions to food, sugar, and screens. He's the creator of the 10 Pillars of Health Method to Assess Your Functional Health, and the creator of Tame the Beast of Addiction Medicine, a revolutionary holistic approach to reversing addiction. So Dr. Shay, that, it's impressive, your yeah. repertoire and everything that you've accomplished and that you've shared your life um, to help other people, which I think is wonderful. So I'm really excited to have you here today. Thank you, I'm really happy to be here. And I know that the topic at hand on, on you know, functional medicine, functional testing and mental wellness, it's a very, 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 very big topic. Yes. And there, the intention of this, the intention of this uh, presentation is I want to give people watching here, what is the big picture overview? What's the 30,000 foot view? I'm not gonna go into some really niche rabbit trail of some nuanced pathway of this, that, and the other. Though those are extremely valuable and worth looking at in other, other videos that, and other information that will be shared uh, down the line, you know, this summit or elsewhere. But the real value I feel I can give the most is what is the framework by which to understand everyone else's framework and where it fits in as a whole within functional medicine and functional testing? Because you can come back to this presentation and see where, does thing, where do things fit from here, 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 here. The, the, one of the biggest problems that I personally experienced in my own journey, as well as uh, working with clients, is that there's so much overwhelm and confusion of, no, you've gotta go do this supplement, no, it's only about meditation, no, it's only, you really gotta focus on sleep, no, it's, it's actually about exercise. Actually, we really wanna focus on the adrenal glands, no, really, it's the mitochondria. You know, your thyroid is actually the real problem. Well, actually, it's toxicity, but I mean, let me tell you about the genes. Let, oh my God, the genes, you know, it's, it's just overwhelming. It's, it's overwhelming, it's confusing. Everyone who is talking about this in the natural health, functional medicine space, you know, very, very understanding, very, very understandable how every person's piece can make total sense. And yet, not every person who's talking about one piece, they can help everybody because everyone is a combination to one degree or another of all these different pieces. So once you have the full map of all the different major pieces, then there's a, it's practical to zone in on what, is the most, what are the most important pieces to focus on and in what order, and then to identify who are the practitioner or practitioners I can really collaborate with because it, it, it's, it, you know, functional medicine and mental wellness is a team sport. And it's really, really helpful to have all the different pieces accounted for. And then we can really focus on what the individual needs. And that's customized, that's customized healthcare. Yes. So uh, I, what I want to do is actually share, um, share a, uh, give a visual on, I have a, a presentation I put together just for this, for this present. Uh, Great, thank you. Uh, for us. Uh, this is great. 
So you, you, it, it's showing up on your side? Yes. Dr. Okay, perfect. All right. So I mean, people can read this and I'm going to also offer, you know, people can have a copy of my ebook as a free gift for this presentation as well. So that they'll get the notes for this. So that's not an issue. Um, there's, we've got to define some things, functional medicine. So functional medicine, my definition is basically a systematic way of thinking. I created a system called the 10 pillars of health, which I'll go into in detail. And the, the 10 pillars is my version of how you can assess the 10 major parts that go into someone's health. Mm -hmm. What it's not is a magic bullet, a trick or a product or a supplement. Those are all strategies underneath. Sorry. Those are all change that. That's a, those are tactics, excuse me. Those are tactics within functional medicine, not functional medicine itself. It's functional medicine is the strategy. It's the big picture, not the actual like goji berry juice or whatever. <laughs> it, it's, it's the big picture overview. The, and to make it real practical for people, if you've got 10 pillars holding up your health and one pillar has crumbled or decayed down to 20% and another is at 90% or 98%. The amount of effort it's going to take you to go from 20% to 80 is the same amount of effort to go from 98 to 100. So it's better to focus on the pillars that are crumbling the most. So you have the fewest, least amount of energy necessary for the inputs to rebuild mm -hmm. that pillar to get the highest number of gains. Now, here is a quote directly from Dr. Bland, the father, or perhaps at this age, grandfather of functional medicine. I mean, we both know Dr. Bland from our studies, you know. And uh, aside from being one of the smartest people, I know he's probably one of the nicest people I know. Absolutely. Yeah, he's, he's kind of glows this grandfatherly kindness. It's, it's kind of hard not to just want to sit in his lap and listen to stories <laughs> yonder years, you know. Yeah. Um, so... Lasting health comes from the interaction of our genes with our lifestyle and environment. Personalizing this connection is the future. Now, there's a lot to unpack in those two sentences. I'd like to highlight the interaction of genes with lifestyle and environment. So genes are very important. In fact, we're going to talk about genetics later on. And it, the, the common saying is that genes load the gun lifestyle and environment pull the trigger. So not everyone with a genetic vulnerability expresses that vulnerability. It's actually the lifestyle environment which actually pulls the trigger. But if there's no bullet in the chamber, then, it, then if you don't have the gene issue, then the, whatever the lifestyle environment happens, you don't get the issue. But there's plenty of people have plenty of other genetic variations where some other issues will show up. Now, I say functional medicine is the best combination of Western diagnostics and natural lifestyle intervention. We have these wonderful toys and scientific tools and labs and all sorts of wonderful, wonderful, wonderful things in Western medicine to assess. Yet the tools in Western medicine are drug, surgery, radiation. Mm -hmm. If they find something in the test that's deemed bad enough, and if it's not deemed bad enough, they usually say, well, come back till it's bad enough and then we'll retest you and then give you a drug, surgery, radiation. Now, um, those are not... Say it again? That's pretty accurate. Yeah. The, um, so the, the tools of Western medicine um, uh, are, are not the tools that we use in functional medicine in terms of help. Now, I should let me make a caveat. There are certain medical doctors in functional medicine that have access to those tools as well and use them as a part of the holistic uh, tool belt if it's called for. And for people like me, who, who I, I'm not a medical doctor, I'm a chiropractor, a puncturist, all these, other, all these other things you read off in the beginning, I collaborate with, uh, with uh, practitioners who have those, that's in their scope of practice for those other things, if, uh, uh, if and when the need arises. And uh, so those tools are available. But fundamentally, the tools of functional medicine is nutrition, diet, lifestyle, exercise, stress assessment, physical structure care, whether it's posture, getting old injuries treated, um, sleep hygiene, dealing with hidden infections, toxic exposure, the hormone rebalancing. There's all sorts of ways that we can help 
that don't involve drug surgery and radiation. Now, the problem with trying to do it all on our own is like, I made this list. All I had to think about was me, what I had to go through in my long journey to try to figure it out. The problem is there's too much confusion. It takes too much time and it costs too much money to do it on your own. Uh, I, there, there, there's the experiences of it. It's unclear where to start. Hundreds of hours in Dr. Google. Thousand, the rattling bag or garbage bag or entire kitchen full of supplements. Not knowing where to prioritize. Confused about diets. On and on and on and on and on. And it, I had a very long journey starting actually when I was six years old where uh, that's when my parents had a very uh, horrific divorce. And uh, I was raised by my stressed out, unhealthy, and tired mompreneur. My father was giving child support. And I had insomnia, gut issues, fatigue, terrible, terrible diet. Both my parents were psychiatrists. And so they knew nothing about nutrition, like zero. And so I was raised on box cereal, bagels, ramen noodles, uh, you know, it just not sugar. It just wasn't good. And I went to a school where uh, violence was accepted, uh, and and it was pretty awful. And so I had a, a war zone at the at school, and at home was not very fun either. Uh, there's no violence at home, but it was just it was very very stressful. Yeah. And I developed a sugar and a video game addicted addiction to cope, and. Um, I even had a coffee habit starting at age six, just because my insomnia was so severe. I needed to have coffee just to stay awake. I remember lying to my teachers in the afternoon. Yes? I, can I back up? Because you said Coke, and I wanted to clarify that. I, I, I'm sorry, what did I say? I think you said Coke, a sugar addiction to Coke. Did sugar, I sugar addiction and video game addiction. I also had soda, uh, but I had a coffee addiction. Oh. I had a coffee habit, I should say at age six um, to, uh, to help me get uh, just to get to school. And I lied to my teachers um, in the afternoon saying I felt sick just so I could go to the nurse's office to take a nap. Um, I had other, I was put on a low fat, high carb diet because my cholesterol was deemed too high at age seven. Um, it, was, it was bad. It was really, really, really bad. And as a teenager, I made a decision. I have to take my health into my own hands. And I remember I started going to um, uh, natural health seminars when I was 16. And uh, I just basically haven't stopped. And, uh, and then I went, I mean, I went through formal training, you know, all the rest of it. But I really started at 16 because I was so unwell and the medical system wasn't helping me. And I was like, I, I got to figure this out. So I've, I've been at this for quite a while. And... I uh, have been through so many different journeys. It's, it's why I was able to put together this 10 pillars of health model because I have gone down so many things uh, because I had to dig out of my own hole. And I, I realized that it wasn't, I was chasing magic bullets. And I re that's, that's why I came with the 10 pillars of health models because it wasn't about chasing a magic bullet. It was about having the whole system together. And I dedicated my life to helping people through natural medicine because that's what worked for me. And this is this common story. So, yeah. That's wonderful because yeah. you no, know, you was something you didn't get, but you found it and you're turning it around and helping others with it. With Absolutely. A and it's a generous way. Yeah, and it's a very common story. It's like the, the archetype of, of Chiron, the healer, the wounded healer. It, it, it's, it's actually, it's an archetype, you know, that mm -hmm. a person who becomes a healer of a certain type, mm -hmm. usually they are wounded in some meaningful way. And through their journey of figuring out what to do for themselves, they acquire the skills, knowledge, and compassion right. to be able to help others because they know how difficult it is and can help shorten people's curve to get well. So... My, I, even though I'm, you know, I, I, I work with people clinically as, as, as a doctor, as a coach, uh, I really fundamentally see myself as an educator. In fact, doctor is old French for teacher. Right. And my, I, I love teaching more than anything. It's one reason why I love doing summits like this. This is great. This is really my jam. And 
uh, my I have ebooks out there, online courses, you know, over 70 videos on YouTube. So there's way more to this this information I have to share. So if people want to get more information, my YouTube channel is probably the best place to start along with my website. And I put together the 10 pillars of health and this is the map, this is the big picture. And what I noticed is that there were, there were 10 major categories and the 10 categories are the following. Uh, I've all begin with a B, it's brain, bowel, body, burst, for burst exercise, biotoxins, Bio nutrients, breakfast, bothers, bugs, and bedtime. So what that means is that the, the, we're going to go over these in, in a bit more detail. The big picture is there are 10 pillars. Now, what I noticed was that people who were chronically unwell, they had a common pattern. They had a minimum seven out of 10 pillars crumbling. That's a lot. That was the common pattern. And these are the people who were like anxiety or uh, depression, chronic gut issues, chronic fatigue syndrome, a hormone imbalance, stubborn weight gain, um, whatever it may be, autoimmune issues. Uh, they had a minimum of seven out of 10 pillars that were crumbling in some meaningful way. And it explained why one person's magic bullet was another person's expensive, waste, expensive supplement urine, you know? Or it's, because if I have seven out of 10 pillars that are at 50% or lower, and I give you, you know, goji berry juice to, you know, squirt up your nose or whatever. And it worked for this person like a miracle, but it didn't work for the person with seven out of 10 pillars crumbling. It makes sense because if you bring one pillar 50% up to 80%, but there's this other six pillars that are 50%, how much better are you really? If you sit on seven tacks and remove one of them, do you feel any better? <laughs> Not, not quite, you know, not quite. So it's, it's improvement, but do you feel better? No, you don't. So uh, this model actually, when I, when I developed this in, two, I think it was like 2011, 2010 or 2011, I developed this. What it actually did is actually salvaged all the magic bullets I was chasing for all those years, because now there are tools that could be used as needed. Right. You know, it, it, it's, it finally made sense why someone could squirt as much goji juice up their nose and they had, they were, now they were selling it. It was their, you know, it was all, they had a wonderful miracle cure in air quotes. And it finally made sense because if they had one pillar that was really down and then they found the one thing and right. then it worked, then suddenly they're selling the thing, you know? Right. And so now I can use, you know, nasal spray or goji juice if we're called for. <laughs> Uh, so uh, this this was the major major insight and why whenever I work with a client I always have them go through the 10 pillars of health survey which is about 300 questions it's not a it, this is not a casual this is like 10, 20 to 30 questions or so 200 to 300 questions total about each of these pillar, uh, no, per 20, 30 questions per pillar. So that's where you get two to 300 questions. Right. It's not a joke survey. And why is it so thorough? It's not to punish someone who's working with me. It's because people who work with me usually have gone to like two, three dozen other clinicians first. And so this, we figured out what pillar is crumbling, which pillars are crumbling, why, when, and in what order priority do we need to rebuild them in terms of lifestyle, diet, nutrition, it's like so on. And then more importantly, to not just in terms of lifestyle in the past, but, but more important is not exactly correct. It's like, in addition to, we figure out what functional tests are most appropriate to figure out what has biochemistry has been broken underneath to then do customized nutrition. Mm -hmm you know, nasal spray, goji juice, or otherwise. So it's, it, it actually helps really clarify what, it, what testing is actually needed. Now, we're going to cover a bunch of tests. It doesn't mean everyone needs these tests. I really want to make that clear. Not everyone needs all these tests. I'm just going to describe them in the big picture as they fit within the 10 pillars of health. Exactly. Additionally, what I learned was that the same 10-pillar model works for anyone 
no matter where, where they are in their health journey, from people who are chronically unwell to people who are feeling normal, relatively symptom-free, or feeling just meh and they don't want to go backwards, to the aspirational, you know, human potential people, the entrepreneurs, the biohackers, yeah, and so on and so forth. So the same 10 pillar assessment is identical. Mm -hmm. You know, what you do with the other end of it, the outputs at the end, that varies based on person's individual circumstance. Now, here's the big, big picture. So this is the cycle of burnout and chronic disease. Now, this, um, this is basically, I've got to minimize the chronic disease. All right. So this is the, this slide is basically 20 years of my life, all right, put on the one slide. Now, it's busy, I know, but this is the entire process on one slide. It's busy, I get it, but this, this, this is the big picture. This is the big, 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 big picture that will contextualize literally everything people are going to go through for the rest of the summit, okay? So here's the big picture. Bad lifestyle choices and or bad life circumstances are the underlying cause. So bad lifestyle choices or circumstances. Now, the difference between a circumstance and a choice is that if you're six years old and you're so stressed out, your adrenals are falling off, you're constipated because you're so much stress and you're not given lots of fiber, you know, in your diet, you're chronically injured from being assailed at school and sitting all day in front of a television or a school desk. Uh, you're not getting much exercise because you're sitting all day. You're you're getting toxic sugar and all sorts of stuff from toxic food. You're not having all the nutrients because you're eating toxic food. Your breakfast is like bagels and margarine and, you know, fake cheese, high stress from school and home, a head infection from summer camp, no one really picked up and chronically chronic insomnia. And you're six years old up to, you know, 10, 12, 14. is that a really a choice or is that a circumstance? Exactly. On balance, it's a choice. It's a circumstance. Now, if you're 60, is it a choice or a circumstance? It's usually choice. Now, there's some Absolutely. realities like severe mental illness, incarceration, um, you know, in you know, severe poverty. All, you know, there are genuine life circumstances where there, are, you know, you really don't really have a choice. You know, in in that. So, you know, asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. There, there are. There are fundamental externalities that affect at someone at any age. Um, now, that being said, the body makes no distinction if it's a choice or circumstance. That's, a, that's really key. It makes, the body is, goes into a survival mode. It goes into a stress response. So if any of these are off for whatever reason, right. voluntary or involuntary, um, you... That is interpreted through your personal set of genetics, and you will have an adaptive response. So there's one or more of the four main adaptive responses. And which ones you do is determined by a combination of your choices and circumstances interpreted through your genetics. Some people are more inflammatory. Some people have more of a blood sugar dysglycemic response. Some people have more tissue erosion and breakdown response. Some people generate way more free radicals, or it's some combination. So the genes are the bridge between each process. That's where genes come in. So if someone has enough bad lifestyle choices or circumstances, they, they create one or more of the four adaptive responses. Chronic adaptation, interpreted through your genetics, again, leads to damaged body systems, which includes, uh, but not limited to, <laughs> Right. The liver, gut, and hormone system. Now, I'm an acupuncturist. There's 12 major organs, but if I put spleen on here, no one except an acupuncturist is going to know what I'm talking about. So we can all agree that the three most important ones that everyone can conceptually understand is the detox system, the digestive system, and the neuroendocrine hormonal control system. Yes. Everyone can agree on that. Um, We'll leave the spleen debate over there somewhere. Uh, so chronic damage then leads to symptoms. Yeah. So fatigue, low mood, mental wellness, indigestion, weight gain, cravings, mental wellness, insomnia, chronic pain, hot flushes. This is the sad symptom kitty. 
very sad with a little Paul versus Tum Tum. I was very happy to find that photo because it was perfect. That's pretty cute, yeah. Very cute, sad little kitty. Uh, so the symptom kitty over here is a visual here. Now, symptoms plus coping mm -hmm. equal bad choices. Starts it all over. And then it goes around and around and around and around. So to review, bad lifestyle choices and or circumstances interpreted through your individual genetics leads to one or more of the four adaptive responses, which chronic adaptation. Now, the body is designed to have an acute response and then resolve it. Like you're chased by a, a wolf pack in the hunter-gatherer era, you survive it, and then it's, it's over. You survived. But we don't have wolf packs and tigers and bears, oh my, today. We have like deadlines. We have the stress of the news, as everyone's familiar with right now, given what's going on. Um, we've got family dramas. We've got all, it just doesn't shut off. Yes. So that's what the chronic adaptation mm -hmm. comes in, leading to organ damage, which then leads to symptoms, and then round and round it goes. So th this is the big, 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 big picture. Yeah. Any. Any questions on this? I think actually it's very eloquently done and relatively not a very packed slide for what you're trying to cover. Okay, thank you. So this, so what do we, now the question is what do we do about this? So this is, I'm gonna give people, again, here's big picture, that's the purpose of this talk. How does a functional medicine practitioner work with an individual? Three separate ways. One, most important, identify the past and present lifestyle. My Gulens, 10 Pillars of Health, other IFM practitioners, they've, they've got a wonderful system there that, I, I developed this before I, I studied with IFM, so I just kept yeah. my thing. It, when I went through IFM, I was like, yeah, I, this is, I'll do all this, just a different yeah. infographic. So it's all good. There's one reason I still was like, wow, IFM's great. They're teaching people really super awesome stuff. So uh this so i've got my little infographics so basically what you do is you check lifestyle and then you give custom lifestyle recommendations in order of priority some pillars are more important than others so some people ask what's the most important priorities okay well it differs from person to person obviously but in general in general the most important ones to start with first is not exercise in my practice, because in my practice, a lot of people come to me very, very fatigued. And if you tell them to start doing exercise, it's really dis disempowering, it, it's demoralizing is the right word. Yes. They, they don't have enough energy to exercise, and so it's demoralizing. So exercise, in my particular practice that I usually attract certain clients that are very fatigued, because I went through severe fatigue. Right. Now in other practices, it may be different, but in my experience, the most important ones are breakfast, getting the starting meal good, mm -hmm. getting their digestion and bowel function better, getting their sleep under control yes. and better, and helping identify the most acute stressors in their life that can be titrated down. Those are the four, usually the top four. Now, bedtime is for teaching purposes, pillar number 10. But for a priority, it has never been priority 10 for an individual person I'm talking to. It's almost always priority one, two, three, or four. So if for teaching purposes, it's pillar 10. It's like never priority 10. So that's, I just, just to make that clear, this is not the, the, the out of the box order in which I help clients with their lifestyle. Right. No, that's actually an important distinction. Yes. And, it's very, and, very right, and you can start with exercise when they can't get out of bed in the morning. Correct. They can do, what they can do is movement. Exercise is a dirty word to a lot of people. So they can do movement. And sometimes the movement is raising the arms up and down in a walking-like fashion. Like you raise your left leg and your right, if someone's that bad, right. then you raise their left leg and their right arm in, like they're walking. Why? Because cross-lateral integration, you know, bipedal, like it's going to help prime the neurological pump. Like there's ways to do movement and even... There's even people who are really so tired they can't really move. They can, I can teach them to do imagine. imagine like we're talking very extreme cases here. Right. For most people, for movement, I recommend if, if they're tired, it's like let's get your walking up. Maybe refer you to Qigong or Tai Chi. And just, just the key is movement, not exercise. People can handle emotionally the word movement. They really can't handle the word exercise, usually. 
uh, at least in my practice. Um, so number one, lifestyle. Yeah, they're on, to me, they're on a continuum. And yeah, exactly. Where they are. Number one, lifestyle. Number two, analyze the genetics. Because if you know the genetics and then you know the lifestyle interventions necessary to dial the genetics, the, using epigenetics to shift the expression of the genes, you can blockade progression. I didn't say block, I said blockade. I, I'm a World War I history nut. So blockades were a big deal back then. Uh, Tell me the difference between block versus blockade. Block means it's a guaranteed, you block it. Okay. Blockade means you've got this uh, armada of ships that it's really gonna be hard to sneak through. Okay. Really, really hard. Now, the reason why I say blockade is because if you have a massive stressor, I don't care what things you do, it's gonna get through and into the adaptive response. That's why I'm, I'm very intentional about the word blockade. Mm -hmm. You can do a huge amount, a massive amount with genetics-based lifestyle interventions, yet you should not be naive to think that I, just because I do my genetics-based lifestyle that I am, it's ne nothing bad is ever gonna be expressed ever. That's complete right. nonsense. Yes. Okay. So, now, the third thing you do, so we've done lifestyle, genetics. The third thing you do is functional testing. Functional testing is what is happening in the body now? What is the cortisol levels in the adrenal gland now? What is the thyroid levels in the thyroid now? What is the state of your mitochondria now? What is your liver doing now? What is your poop telling you? Do you got is your digestion? Do you have fungus, protozoa, viruses, bad bacteria, or, or other, you know, other stowaways that are, are chewing up your nutrients on your behalf, uh, secreting toxic chemicals inside you, or gnawing on the organs themselves and creating molecular mimicry, which is the basis of you know, autoimmune diseases. So three things, lifestyle, genetics, functional testing. Genetics doesn't tell you what you have now. It tells you what your genes are for now and forever and have always been. That's about probabilities uh, and, and things you can anticipate and things you can do to, to mitigate progression and to help you with your longevity into the future. But genes do not tell you what your blood sugar is now, what your, you know, it doesn't tell you any of that. So that's why the functional testing is a really, really, really critical part. It's a three-legged stool. Mm -hmm. And that's why I, I, I very much endorse people doing a three-legged approach here of com combining the genes of functional testing and the lifestyle. So once you have all that information, then you have a customized their lifestyle, diet, nutrition, et cetera, truly. Yes. That can you reverse this whole cycle. So that's the, that is the overview of the big picture. And as it relates to mental wellness, it, it, it perfectly slots in. So if someone's anxious or depressed or uh, nervous or they've got anger issues or whatever it may be, by the way, I just mentioned the four main things I dealt with growing up. Um, this entire model perfectly yes. addresses that. So it's, uh, and, and you know, even if, uh, if it gets to a point where people do need pharmacological intervention for certain mental conditions, uh, you can see where that fits in as well. Where, where pharmacy fits in, again, not my scope, but where pharmacy fits in is if someone's symptoms are so bad, pharmacy is used to stabilize the symptoms by shifting them to a different set of more tolerable symptoms. To do what? Buy time right. to back up this entire cycle to look at their physiology, look at their genes, and look at their lifestyle. That is the best use of medications is to stabilize in order to buy time to then work on the root issues. That's where I view pharmacy as being a useful tool if applied correctly right. in this whole process. Right. I agree. Uh, so the next, so just some more detail on the brain. So brain, the center, uh, the bullseye is the brain. Uh, when in doubt, ask yourself, is this good or bad for my brain? And 
Uh, some of the main things are that affect the brain are unending chronic stress, uh, what's called decision fatigue, making too many decisions. It just, just messes up your dopamine level, your, your ability to like, you can't make decisions at the end of the day. Uh, too much stimulation from screens. And then there's several tests, functional tests that really apply to the brain and hormones. My favorites are adrenal testing, mitochondria testing. Uh, also, uh, thyroid should be on there as well. And um, I want to show you my adrenal results as an example. So what the adrenal glands do is that they release cortisol. Cortisol does a lot of things, one of which is your ability to adapt to stress. It also helps drop inflammation and, and a couple of things. So when someone is flatlined, this is a salivary test. So I, I do salivary cortisol, not blood. The problem with blood cortisol is that uh, if you are told to go to a blood lab at 8 a.m., not have breakfast to get your blood drawn to check your stress hormones, well, what just happened? You skip breakfast, so your cortisol is higher, you're stressed out about traffic, and then you end up in an office when someone in a white coat is coming at you with a needle. Really think your cortisol levels are going to be accurate. On top of that, they combined bound and free cortisol into the same thing, which is wrong. You want free cortisol, not bound. So this is why I, I don't endorse blood cortisol unless you're trying to check for Addison's or Cushing's disease, which is the far extremes of adrenal pathology. We're looking at functional. So, uh, so functional is looking at the gray space between optimal and pathological. So that's where the salivary tests come in because the salivary tests, you just check it through the day. You don't have to fight traffic, have a needle stuck in your arm. You just spit into a tube for actually now it's six times a day because there's an, up, there's an upgraded test that now I only run, a cortisol awakening response, which I won't go into in here. But there's a more advanced test now than the four spot, but that's another talk. So you do – Four spots through the day to check your rhythm. Now, when you're flatlined, like I was, this is 2015, you can't adapt to stress. Okay, it's really it's tired, fatigued, uh, you know, like easily stressed out and, and like just want to run away from things. Now, March 2017, it improved, but it, it, it's still the morning was still a struggle. Then I went, this is March 7, 2017, this is March 2018, it's kind of the same here. It's a different company that did this, but it's okay. even though I had way better um, lifestyle, yeah. I had massive stress during this period, moving countries, death of a mentor, sickness of a parent. It was, it, it, that's, it was awful. Then, this is what it was during that time, then January 2019, it's textbook perfect. Okay, so you can actually change. Right. You can improve. It is possible. Right. But it also takes a fair amount of time for it to show on this kind of. Yes, and it's not like you decide to get treat your adrenal glands and life suddenly stops being stressful. That doesn't happen, yeah. you know, like 2018 being an example. This is a comparison of before and after. Yes. So flatline versus textbook normal. Now, the other tests I love to do for brain and hormones is mitochondria testing. I love mitochondria testing. Love it. In fact, I have an entire video on my YouTube channel from the mitochondria summit that was put on by Dr. Jay Davidson, where I spent one hour just going over the advanced mitochondria panel called the ion panel. Mm -hmm. If people want to nerd out on the mitochondria, please go to my YouTube channel and watch that hour video and I'll walk through, this is just a tiny piece of that test, but the mitochondria is the most important thing to think about when in terms of brain health because you, mitochondria are the f energy factories. You can't run your brain without enough electricity and the mitochondria generate the chemical electricity to run the brain. So if you're concerned about mental health, I mean, we talk about the adrenal glands, adrenal glands are very closely connected to mood, like anxiety, nervousness, depression. So is the mitochondria. If your frontal lobes require a huge amount of mitochondria, if your frontal lobes go down because of mitochondrial retraction, which is the technical term in the literature, um, you have lower activation frontal lobes, which is like depression, anxiety, like all these things. You know, low, low self-control. Like I went, came out of two addictions, uh, sugar and video games. So you can test your mitochondria. That's amazing. Like that's, that's so awesome. And 
uh, just to give an example, if someone has, you know, everything is really high, that means the engine's running hot. You, you flooded it, like it, it's running too hot. If it's really low, that means the engine's like half melted. <laughs> okay. So if, and if it's good, if it's between, if like if it's kind of in the middle, most of then what you do is then you look for outliers. So the problem with people running this mitochondria, the, the, the mistakes most people make when they're running this test is that they only look at the, the outliers and they chase individual nutrients. That's wrong. Yes. In most cases, you want to look for the patterns of is it too high or too low first. Yes. And only if things are nicely even distributed, and if there's one or two things way out on the sides, then you can give specific nutrient dosages for those things. And, and that's, this is why people, they get this wrong on the testing. Uh, so th this is why I dedicate so much time to testings because if you get it right, it solves so many things, so many problems. Now, bowel, this is the, um, digestion. How well do you poop and how well do you digest? Now, uh, I got into this game. I st my first book I ever read was Dr. Jensen's, I read on natural health, was Dr. Jensen's Guide to Better Bowel Care. When I was 16 years old, Okay because I had severe constipation. And so I got into this because of poop. And so here I am. I will talk happily about poop. Poop is underestimated. It sure. is, yeah. So uh, mistakes, people rush eat, they have poor pooping or they skip pooping, they ignore gut problems like excessive gas. Um, and what people really want to do is to get their gut tested. And I run gut tests on most people, it's very rarely do I come across someone that doesn't need it, but if they don't need it, they don't need it. You know, that's, that's why I do the yeah. template assessment first. Right. So I'll give you an example. Uh, this is a person with, who, who super high fat in the stool. This is not blood. This is stool, okay? Fat in the stool. They, their skin was a mess. Why? Because they weren't absorbing fatty acids with the fat-soluble vitamins needed for, for, for skin health. So I didn't, I didn't slather his skin with stuff. I fixed his digestion. The, you worked on the inside for yeah. the outside. Correct. So this is a pre and post. So this is May, what is that? Eight months later, seven months later, whatever. Um, there you go. You can normalize it. Yeah, six months. Then um, fix your physical. The body, so the body re relates to old injuries, particularly you know misalignments in the spine, old sports injuries, um, people been in car accidents, people at the wrong end of physical violence. It also includes bad dental work. Uh, bad dental work will ruin anyone's life. Uh, chronic pain. Wait a minute. Let's uh, back up for a second. Bad dental work, meaning not poor dentition, but if you've actually gone on and had work done. Both. Okay. Both head injuries. Mm -hmm. uh, look, bad, bad dental work will ruin anyone's life. I mean, if, and if you have not known anyone or have not experienced it yourself, you are lucky and just wait until you meet someone who's had bad dental work and that, that rat massively hurts their health. Okay. Um, so, uh, and it's also genetics because the physical body is, is like that twins. They have the same body because they're the same genetics, you know? So this is where I slot genetics. And um, mistakes people make is they sit all day, they ignore or push through injuries, they don't test their genetics. And so and there's inflammation. Now, what's the point of inflammation? Inflammation is the body's repair, emergency repair system to heal broke or injured tissue and also to fight off uh, uh, potential infection. Now, if you're a hunter-gatherer and you're chasing an animal 20 times your body weight with a sharp, with a sharp stick, it's very likely you're going to get bitten, mauled, trampled, you know, or clawed, it's, or gored. So what, what happens if you're bit? You get an, intra, an injection of pathogenic infections plus a tissue injury. Yeah. So naturally, inflammation is there to deal with both. Right. Okay? So some people are like, oh, no, I got my genes, and I am so over-inflammatory. That is so unfair. Well, number one, I'm one of these people. I had massively pro-inflammatory genetic profile. To date, I have the single worst genetic profile of anyone I've ever run genetics on in terms of number of uh, you know, unfortunate alleles or red and yellow dots, however you want to call it, all right? And 
the reality is that at, at my genetically, if I go back as a hunter gatherer, and if I'm hunting with all my hunting buddies, and we got bit, I was more likely to survive because I had a more exuberant inflammatory response than they did. This is, so there, there was a, a, an evolutionary advantage in certain environments for an exuberant inflammatory response. So I, that removed the existential resentment to existence over why this genes to me now this is so unfair. Yeah. It's contextual. It's environment. I would have had a huge advantage as a hunter gatherer. So anyway, um, no, but that's really, really important because I think sometimes people get stuck and you've got to take, as you yeah, said, the pity party yeah. from genes is real. Like a lot of people get emotionally spun out when they get their genes back. And I can tell from personal experience, one, that happens. I, I cried for a day when I got my gene report back and then I snapped out of it. It's like, wait a minute. I actually know what to do. I actually have a blueprint. Exactly. You know, it's, it's, it's the, the grief is real when you get back a really strong, bad gene report it's real i've experienced it people get about so much validation when they get yeah. the report and they're like i'm not crazy exactly that the flip side of grief is relief of like now it makes sense because i was very sick as a child in kind of these invisible ways you know i didn't look unwell except really pale but i was so unwell on the inside that no one could see and then when i got my gene report i was like oh that's why that's why. So uh, I'm just going to mention briefly some of the genes about inflammation. People, you know, over inflame, it's not a big lighter with inflammation, it's a tsunami, or they can't put it out. And so it's just hot coals all the time. They don't, they don't have fire hoses, they have a squirt gun. So people can either overproduce or under clear genes. Now, here's an example of one client who she she got her genes done, and so she's a over inflamer. She over initiates, she over propagates, and she has difficulty to quench it. Now she has a, a, tri a triad here of the three main liver inflammatory genes here, which is significant because she went and got a personal trainer without telling me. And this is the you know CrossFit style personal trainers that just overwork you every day of the week. And what happened is she started to lose muscle tone. Her muscles got washed out. She actually got fatter and her, her menstrual cycle went completely bonkers. Why? Because too much exercise tripped inflammation massively. So what happened? She started to retain water, which happens when you're in, when you, inflammation is toxic chemicals. Your body will retain water to dilute the toxic chemicals so it doesn't kill your cells. That's what it does. So that's why people put on water weight. People who, people who are over inflamers, telltale sign. The more they work out, the less they see their muscles. They just get washed out. Say that again, please. The more, when, the, the, if someone, the harder someone exercises, the less muscle tone they show, they're an over inflamer because they, they've overshot and now their body's retaining water and is washing out the muscle tone. And then for her, not only did she lose muscle tone, her hormone system went off. Why? Because her liver was so clogged with dealing with the inflammation, it couldn't regulate her hormones. So she contacted me in a panic. She's like, what's happening? I said, let me just recheck your genes here. And by the way, please don't ever get a personal trainer again without running them by me first. Um, and because I have choice words for that trainer who, who totally missed this. Mm -hmm. um, that I rechecked it. This is what we saw. I was like, okay, I put her on an anti-inflammatory lifestyle, anti-inflammatory supplements, cut down her training to two to three days a week maximum with at least a day of rest in between and lots of walking and movement on the off days and just rest and relaxation and her muscle tone came back, her menstrual cycle normalized, and then she was able to get the benefits of the personal trainer because they titrated it down to what was actually healthy instead of overshooting. Right. More, so, not necessarily better. More, not for exercise. Not, no, 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 no. That, that's, that's, that's rare that that happened. Like, people should really focus on movement every day and high intensity interval training twice a week. Mm -hmm. That's about it. Okay. 
in general. Now, I have a whole write-up. When people work with me, I have an entire write-up on safe, high-intensity interval training. Uh, you know, the, the metric, the, what they say is H-I-I-T or HIT. I say, no, you want SHIT, S-H-I-I-T, safe, high-intensity interval training, not just high-intensity interval training. But so a lot of biohackers are very type A or very more is better. So that right. and, and when I give, I give a version of this talk called How to Biohack Your Biohacking, <laughs> and uh, I really piss off a lot of biohackers, but then they come around and see that I'm actually on their side. Right. And, and then I've, I've, been on, I've been on several, uh, what was it called? Biohacker Babes podcast. <laughs> um, biohacker, like, they're, they're lovely. Like, they're, they're, they're these two sisters that um, are into biohacking. So I, I have a version of this in, in regards to biohacking uh, on their podcast. So, um, yeah, the genes are really, really important. And so once, once, I, once I, knew, I knew this information, I could help pull back on just one example or exercise. Right. Then there's vitamin D. <clears throat> now, as it relates to mental wellness, let me just back up. So inflammation, <laughs> kind of important for mental wellness. If you're inflamed, it's going to affect your brain. Yep. Affect, and we can just kind of leave it there. That's, that's, the, that's the simple sentence to just kind of encapsulate all the most important parts. Additionally, there's vitamin D. So this is another report from the same company that I use, FitGenes, for genetics. Mm -hmm. And if this is a... Vitamin D is actually quite complicated. Like, can you make it from sunlight? And if you do, is it pulled out into the fat cells because you have inflammatory, because of certain inflammatory genes? Can your liver convert it? Can, it, can what's been converted get onto the protein to get to the kidneys? And can the kidneys convert it to true vitamin D? And then, can you use it? Right. So they're getting it into the blood system, but then there's, do you have the vitamin D receptors? That's what VDR stands for. Can you actually use the vitamin D that finally got into your blood system? Can you use it now to use it in the cells to, number one, deal with inflammation and deal with immunology? So vitamin D is super, super important for um, mental health, mental wellness. Uh, we also see it, you know, studies right now with a virus at hand that people who end up in more severe conditions in the hospital, they have way, 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 way low vitamin D compared to the people who aren't uh, found in critical care to nearly degree people with low vitamin D are. Then we've got methylation. And this is by far the most confusing, overwhelming, and controversial part of genetics as it relates to mental health. Yeah. Most people poop themselves over their MTHFR genes. They just, they just freak, oh my God, I have a variation, I'm doomed. No, no, that's not true. Why? Well, here is, I don't know, 12, 15, or dozen or so different genes that are related to this whole pathway. You have to look at the entire picture. Now, the, the, I use Fit Genes, which is just um, the most amazing genetics company I've ever found. And I've got loads, of, this is huge amount of material on it. But, uh, say it again? I can tell that you love it. I have, I'm just not familiar with this particular. Yeah, yeah. So, what, what I, I it, I have hours of content on my YouTube channel for more detail, but basically people fixate on the methylation and they don't need to just fixate a hundred percent. Inflammation controls methylation. You know, like you, there are tiers of importance. So methylation is actually kind of downstream. So there's, there's orders of priority in terms of what genes matter more than others. And there are genuine things you can do for methylation, but it's not just freaking out a MTHFR gene. There's so many other things involved. Like, like this is, like B12 is involved. This, people have, some people have, you know, the two main B12 genes are good, so it's mixed. Mm -hmm. Compt is a big one in mental health, you know, the warriors versus warriors thing. And there's many, whether on one or the other, there's different things you can do for lifestyle to help. You know, genes is a huge, huge thing. I love it, as you can tell. And, uh, it's worth looking at for if you're concerned about mental well-being. Then for burst exercise, um, this is about movement. Uh, this is the fourth pillar. Oh, so wait, this is, wait a minute. Burst means movement. Okay, exercise. So I couldn't find a word for exercise that began with a B, okay. except for burst training. Okay. That's, that's why. I did that. Bur so high-intensity interval training is also called burst training. 
Oh, okay, first train. Gotcha. I learned that from Dr. Mark J. Smith, who I learned the majority of this information from. Okay. On exercise, I mean. Um, so this is a sprinter. This is a marathoner who looks healthy. Right, exactly. Yeah. I have an article on my blog, which is uh, diplomatically entitled, Why Marathoners Look Like Cancer Patients. Yeah. Yeah. So that's to do with cortisol, and they're burning out their adrenals, and the adrenal glands are just so overtaxed from marathoning that it erodes all the muscle tissue equally. And there Except are people that do, like, extreme marathons, too. Oh, yeah, that's, that's, that's nuts to me. Um, I grew up out next to Heartbreak Hill for the Boston Marathon, and one of our close friends died of, you know, dropped drop dead. Uh, and by the way, he dropped dead not doing a marathon, because the problem, one, one of the many problems with marathoning, one of the many, is you only train your heart at that rate. You just jog at that pace. Your heart is trained for sleeping, sitting, walking around, eating, and jogging. There's no, Very you know, if you have to sprint from something or you have, so he died hiking up a mountain, which was way harder on his heart than just zoning on jogging. And he died in his son, son's arms. Oh. It, it, so he didn't have the, the, the variability of his heart because he was just marathoning all the time. Yeah. So I, I take this stuff very seriously because we've lost dear family friends and pillars in the community. So, uh, there's also an inflammation body fat loop that if you inflame, you can trigger more You can trigger more body fat because more body fat creates more inflammation which then creates more body fat. Particularly if you have the interleukin-6, uh, I mean, it's, it's okay. this one. Interleukin-6, right there is the main one that triggers it. This is why my, my client, she just got fatter and fatter, the more, she, it became this positive feedback loop of she got fat from the inflammation, which then made more inflammation, which da 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 yeah. So uh, next one, we got biotoxins. Now, I cheated by putting the word bio in front of toxins to make it a B, but I'm fine <laughs> with it. Um, so as it relates to mental health, like toxins absolutely screw up your, let's talk about sugar. Just sugar alone will, we don't talk about the really kind of, you know, like lead and stuff. Just, just talk about sugar. Sugar will mess up your brain. And as one example, alcohol, do I need to say anything more? Off-gassing of carpets, off-gassing of paints, fast food, you know, deep fried food, energy drinks, soda, all these things are really bad. Now you can do genetic testing. Some people can tolerate, uh, and part of the gene panels, liver genes, the mitochondria test can include six, include six liver pathways. Uh, if you do the advanced one, then you can get the amino acids that, that feed into the liver cycle, you recycle, you can get the, the fatty acids that look at the inflammatory level. Like, there's all sorts of great stuff that you can do. You can do food intolerance testing if you want. Uh, these are examples of the six markers on the mitochondria test. Uh, this, this one right here, this is an example of someone. Glucorate is, is like the marker to check for pharmaceutical tolerance. This person is over double the upper limit of the fifth quintile, which is statistical geek speak for he's got problems. Yeah. He's got bad problems. Okay, and there's three of these markers are for glutathione utilization. So meth two methyl heparate, this is about general toxic chemicals. Oratate is about your ability to clear nitrogen from the urea cycle. Glucorate is a pharmaceutical marker. This is what, Dr. Lord put this together in the 70s. And um, he's, he's actually come out of retirement and is teaching in the Kalish Institute for the advanced students, um, of which I'm lucky enough to count myself as one of them. So it's, it's like he's, this is the, the guy who invented half of all the functional tests we base functional medicine testing on. He's come out of retirement to like update us on all the research and all the stuff. He just released a new textbook actually, by the way. Uh, it's like a 1400 page textbook available on Apple books. Um, and okay. it's a beast. It is, and it's a wonderful book. It's huge though, but it's searchable. You can click on the links. Like it's, it goes right to the articles. He cites like it, it's a, it's genius. Like it's, it, it's his, it's, it's his magnum opus. I mean, and anyone's really interested in nerding out on this stuff. You can go drop 270 bucks on Apple Books and spend several years really digesting what that book has to say. Um, 
Now, this is an example. The, uh, the advanced mitochondria test also includes heavy metals. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to give you an example of a pre and post of a client. I did not put him on a heavy metal detox. I, I want to make that very clear. Mm -hmm. I did not put him on a heavy metal detox. What did I do? I dealt with everything else. His gut, his mitochondria, his adrenals, his lifestyle, his sleep, all these other things. He's not, this is him dropping aluminum, arsenic, and mercury by 50% was not a mercury detox. It was lifestyle assessment and shifting. Yes. I, I really want to urge people to be incredibly cautious about doing a heavy metal detox if they have a mental wellness concern. Heavy metal detoxes are very difficult on the body. Very, very hard. I only do heavy metal detox after checking their genes, their adrenals, their mitochondria, and their gut at a minimum. And, may, and give time to recalibrate all of those so you're strong enough to deal with the heavy metals. It's very hard to get rid of heavy metals. And it's very, it's, it's hard and it can create weird symptoms and blow up on your face. Okay? I overdid detox when I was younger and I hurt myself. Oh, wow. I hurt myself doing detox too quickly and aggressively. And I was in my early 20s. Yeah. Okay? So yeah. I'm very militant about this. I'm very cautious about heavy metal detox. That's another example of more is not better. Yeah, more is not better with heavy metal detox. Get the basics dealt with first. Lifestyle, genetics, gut, adrenal, mitochondria, minimum. Minimum. Before you dare go into heavy metals. Okay? Nutrients, the bio, I cheated again, put the bio in front of nutrients, it works, don't apologize for it, love the model, whatever. <laughs> uh, bionutrients is the opposite of biotoxins, it's everything you do need. So I, you know, with fats, proteins, and, you know, uh, vitamins, minerals, I include sunlight and oxygen because you metabolize those. Sunlight and oxygen, it, it's, it's, it's part of this. Yes. Uh, people are cooped up inside too much. They, they need... They, when they're they, sheltering in? Huh? When they're sheltering in? Well, you can do spot five, stand outside in the sun for five minutes at a time. You know, it's not... There, there's micro dosing of sunlight. They use this actually in, in the tuberculosis days back in the early 1900s. There's these incredible charts of you expose one foot for five minutes on day one. Then it's two feet on day two for five minutes. And then it's... 10 minutes on each, like, the, you, there's like this entire chart of building sunlight exposure on different parts of the body to build up immunity. It's, it's fascinating. But, um, right, but I, I'm serious with the shelter in and people not leaving the house. Oh, yeah, they need, they need to. Yeah. And it's ironic and tragic because the people who are most risk of dying in the hospitals are those with the lowest amounts of vitamin D based on the current research that I've seen. Rhonda, Rhonda Patrick, Dr. Rhonda Patrick, like, went on Joe Rogan and talks for like an hour on vitamin D or something. I mean, maybe it was like 40 minutes. I can't remember. But she was like, vitamin D, vitamin D, vitamin D, you know? Mm -hmm. So uh, sunlight matters. And then with nutrition, you know, there's lots of micronutrient tests, you know, food intolerances. And, and I want to highlight something really unique that's come down the pike with genetics. Hmm. Carb choice test. This is only done by fit genes. It's one of the reasons I love this country, uh, this company, is that, um, is that uh, there's a gene test now to tell you, are you more suited for keto, paleo, Mediterranean, or high carb? Okay. I have a whole video, a set of videos actually on this on my YouTube channel. Just you know, put in Dr. Sam Shea carb choice or Dr. Sam Shea diet. You'll find it. Um, but you can genetically determine if you are better suited for a keto or paleo Mediterranean high carb, this is absolute watershed test. Everyone should do this. I had a perfect Mediterranean diet. I knew all my farmers. I knew the cows. I sprouted like it was like hand raised quinoa by left-handed monks picked on the full moon. Doesn't matter. Okay. I still having digestive problems. Oh, wow. Yeah. When I ran my carb choice, I had the second lowest carb tolerance possible. I was a two out of 20. 
I wasn't gluten intolerant. I was carb intolerant. Yeah. And that's also, yeah. So once within one week, one week of shifting my diet to my genetic capacity for carbs, which was really small, my digestive problems of 20 years went away. One week. Now, digestive problems included bloating, discomfort, mm -hmm. uh, occasional gas pain, but really it was like super foul wall paint peeling, fly killing farts that would evacuate, you know, uh, a yoga class. It's, <laughs> and it was terribly, I had to pick between being in pain or being ostracized. And, and there's, there's a point where you can't take the pain anymore, right. you know? So 20 years of suffering with this, and it was, I was eating outside of my genetic capacity. And it wasn't SIBO? No. Right, Not no, I, I, sure it wasn't, because um, you would have figured that out. But. Oh, definitely. Yeah, see, I took, I took buckets of probiotics, and it didn't make it worse, didn't make it better. I, took, I ran gut tests, I ran all these things. Nothing, nothing indicated my genetic capacity for, for carbs except this test. Mm -hmm. And that was, this was the missing piece. So the basics are that you, you have a, it's, it's like shoots and scissors. Like your, your body has the number of gene, the, the, it had the gene that makes amylase, the enzyme that breaks down carbs in the saliva. We're not talking about variations, whether it's a red, yellow, or green dog. We're talking about duplicates. Okay. So like, that's the difference. This is copy. It's, the, the technical term is called the copy number in the literature. So if I have uh, this, this saliva produce, this amylase producing gene. But if I have only one copy and I get one, I get a unit of carbs, I get one unit of saliva. But if I have nine copies of this gene in the same, in the same one unit of carbs, I get nine X the amount of amylase. So I had a two. Gotcha. So very, very low. And it's, so people who are really low, they're the keto up to paleo, people who are in the middle or Mediterranean, people who are high, they're high carb. High carb people do exist. Not that many, but right. most people are in the, the five to eight range, which is, which is shades of gray of the Mediterranean diet, which is why the Mediterranean diet is useful for most people in most circumstances, but not all people at all times in all circumstances. For people like me, it was not working, and you know? High carb diet as a kid, right? Oh yeah. It's worst possible. It's terrible. Yeah. Wow. Pillar number seven is breakfast and routines. So it's not just eating breakfast all routines, morning and evening routines. One of the fastest ways to get people to have a healthier lifestyle is to really get their morning and evening routine dialed in. My first ebook was on breakfast. It was that important. So uh, people can, you know, if the people want this free gift as well, I can get them to them as well. They can get my, my ebook on functional medicine and my ebook on uh, breakfast. Wonderful. You know, it's really, really important to people have a good starting meal. And I cover, I cover all sorts of stuff in, in the ebook. Uh, it's, 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 it was my first, it's almost like fourth or fifth edition I did. I can't remember. Anyway, so we won't go, we won't go back over the saliva test because we already covered it. Pillar number eight is bothers, which has to do with stress. So I love that. Thank you. And this is the best picture I could find on it. So too many decisions, multitasking. It's stress in all its forms. So marital stress, relationship stress, financial stress, uh, world stress, uh, stress that's going on in your city, the uh, existential stress, spiritual stress, clutter, multitasking, overwhelm, addiction, etc. Um, Stress is huge. So there's lots of tests that can go over it, like genetics, adrenal, mitochondria, the advanced mitochondria test. Th those are all really, really important. Um, pillar number nine is bugs. It's your relationship with all things microscopic. We're, we're heading to the end here. Uh, everything is microscopic. So people, why is it in the bowel? Because, well, mold is a thing, and that's not in your bowel. And I lived in New Zealand for eight years, and mold is everywhere you know damp it's a damp surrounded ocean by all four sides the only bad thing i've heard about new zealand yeah new zealand's like any other country there's good parts and bad parts and 
this is definitely not the time to round up people's perspective on New Zealand. So uh, there, it's like any country. There's good parts and bad parts. Um, mold is definitely there as bad, very bad. Um, so you do you check hidden infections in the gut. You can check for mold in many ways, but but the hidden infections in the gut. Gut will affect mood. Now we talked about gut will affect mood and. I went to a three-day conference in Melbourne just on gut and brain alone. That was just all three days, gut brain. So improving your gut is one of the, it's like, if you had to pick two functional tests right out the gate, ideally three, it'd be gut and adrenals for, for mood. If someone's, I would really throw on the mitochondria as well, but a lot of practitioners struggle with interpreting that so because it, it's 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 a difficult test to interpret um the gut is so important for mental well-being as someone who had terrible gut issues growing up I, I can speak to this personally this is an example of one type of gut test there's there's there's, there's about four or five major competing gut tests mm -hmm. so you know this person had a klebsiella a proteus and a citrobacter you know, it, it, by the way, if you get into these tests, you are a killer at Scrabble. <laughs> Just killer. Uh, and you can see that not all antibiotics work on all infections. And yet when you look at the nutraceuticals, what they work really well. And you don't just give one, you give a big combo to get rid of infections. I give about a dozen plus herbs and nutrients when someone has a, a gut infection. You know, it's just, it's just, yeah. Up. Um, now for mood, sleep is up there again, top three or so. Uh, I was a severe insomniac. Uh, it's about, you know, sleep is real important. Depth, duration, quality, and consistency of sleep. And what are the functional tests for sleep? Uh, mitochondria, because it has a melatonin pathway on it. Um, advanced mitochondrial panel has the L-tryptophan L -tryptophan levels on it adrenal stress test or evening cortisol really really important you can throw gut on there if you're having dysglycemia which wakes you up in the middle of the night or liver which is wakes you in the middle of the night from dysglycemia your liver's not able to pump out enough uh glucose at night to keep you your brain happy so functional tests do tie into mental wellness and as you can see they're connected very specifically with the 10 pillars of health including genetics so this is just kind of a summary like adrenal People who have low thyroid, their mood is depressed and low. People with hyperthyroid, they're more anxious. So thyroid is also on the cards. Mitochondria, gut testing, food intolerances, genetics, uh, functional. And the functional tests are available almost everywhere. Uh, almost everywhere. And yeah, uh, functional medicine is not just some secret nutrient or technique. It's a systematized... It, it's, it's a system of thinking. It's, it's, not, it, it's not some magic bullet. Um, Ten Pillars of Health is that system. We have all the toys now with Western medicine, Western science. So functional medicine is the best of Western medicine diagnostics, genetics, yes. functional labs, with the best of, of natural medicine lifestyle interventions. That's what I recommend people really focus on if they want to holistically approach their mental well-being. And as someone who's come out of two addictions and dealt with a lot of mental um, stress and the expressions of that growing up, I can speak firmly to the effectiveness of functional medicine. And that's what I dedicate my life to. And if people want to contact me, um, they can find my website uh, drsamshay.com. Uh, they've also got in the eBooks, I've got ways to contact me as well. They can schedule Good. a 15 minute discovery call with me. It's on, and I can happy to talk about people's individual circumstance and see if the approach I offer is appropriate for them. If they're a good candidate for the type of in-depth detailed, uh, care that I offer. Some people are, uh, you know, there's certain people with certain mental conditions that I am not, uh, this, this is not the first step for them. This, this should not be the first step. Some people need to be triaged 
right. over to more acute pharmaceutical care first. For stabilization. Uh, stabilization, yes. exactly. So yes. I, I do not take on every case that someone calls me. This, this, is, this is part of being a good clinician. You know, you know, really make sure that it's the right fit. Uh, the, the program that I personally work with people, it's, it's, it's involved. It's the 10 pillars of health. It's genetics testing. It's functional testing. Uh, it's, it's, it's a lot of coaching and uh, I put my heart and soul into it and not everyone is ready at this time to commit to that level of, of focus and, and, it's, and care. And, and I respect that. I respect people where they are in their journey. I respect where they are. And so I will tell people this is not the right fit. If it's not the right fit and try to find appropriate referral, if it is a fit, welcome aboard. And uh, I, I, love, I love these summits, the ones that you're doing, because it gives people an opportunity, a very, very, very low investment, mm -hmm. to get a broad sweep of what's available right. in the mental wellness world. And so they can really get educated for very low investment uh, uh, to just see what is the playing field out there. And I think, I mean, I think it was such a wonderful... 30,000 foot view for a Thank big you. perspective. It really, really was. And it's expressed so wonderfully. I know it up here, it's so hard to express it. And that one graph, it does it beautifully. So, I, you know, plus all the little tidbits along the way. Right, right. Fun. Um, so thank you, Dr. Sam, really. Um, and, you know, I, you know, really value you that you took your own journey and are sharing it with others, what you've learned. So, and it is a, um, a very well-known story, but still, um, I think it's remarkable when people, because I can tell how much um, of your life has gone into this. Thank so, you. So I really appreciate it and I'm so happy you were able to share that with us. Thank you. So, um, to eat, um, we will make sure um, the link is in the email, mm -hmm. for your website, and your free gifts. And um, thank you so much. Well, thank you for, for putting the time and effort into putting this summit on. It's, I am very aware of how much work that takes. And it's a labor of love, uh, first and foremost. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I, I, I really i uh, am grateful for the opportunity to share this on your summit. Uh, I, I really, really hope that, the, that out of the gate, people will have this 30,000 foot view to then contextualize everything else and make the entire, not just for the summit, but beyond the entire journey. Of course. More sense. And I'm so, so thankful for this opportunity, truly. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Take care. Bye. Bye now.